Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. You've probably heard the phrase, don't put God in a box. It's a fairly common phrase, and it's used to refer to the reality that we are not able to, as creatures, to limit God in any way, which seems pretty obvious, right? Um, that's part of what makes God God, right? Nothing or no one can control him. But I find it a much more interesting question to ask, but what if God puts himself in a box? What do we do then? What if God is not being limited by anyone, but he chooses to limit himself? What are we supposed to do about that? Well, my sort of snide answer to that question has always been, well, we should probably open the box that God has put himself in, don't you think? Well, in our gospel reading today, Jesus is teaching us a little bit about God's way of limiting himself and how he decides to relate to us, especially now that Jesus has come into the picture right, that the incarnation of the Son of God is going to change a few things. And he does this, he teaches us this, with a human story, right, and a human accounting of an event that happens um, that people can probably relate to, and that's the event of a child being lost in a festival, right? Now, maybe this hasn't personally happened to you, or um, maybe you just know somebody who's, who it has happened to, but whether you're the child who got lost or the parents who are frantically searching or the friend who just knows the story, you can relate on some level. So the story is set up with the family, Jesus and his parents go to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, one of the high feast days of the year, where you come and make sacrifices in the temple and worship God in thanksgiving for the Passover, right? When the angel of death passed over the people of Israel um, because of the blood of the lamb uh, back in Egypt, as that was the last thing that set them free from their slavery to the Egyptians. So it's a big celebration of remembering God's mighty work of deliverance. So they go to Jerusalem and they make their sacrifices and they offer their worship to God. And usually if you're coming from a different village, you go into groups with your relatives and neighbors. Uh, and so um, it wasn't really that uncommon for Mary and Joseph to not have seen Jesus right when they left because they were in a big group and he would have known, they would have all known each other. But they become aware that Jesus isn't with them and that he's not with the group at all. And so as any good parent would do, they immediately turn around and return to Jerusalem to try and find their son, right? Where's Jesus? And the text tells us that they're very distressed, right? In verse, uh, in verse 48, that's what Mary says when she addresses Jesus. She says, didn't you know we were searching for you in great distress, um, is what she says. And, it's, and it also tells us they searched for three days in Jerusalem to try and find Jesus. Can you imagine the sort of distress? Now, parents not being able to find their child for three days. That's 72 hours of not knowing where their son was. That's some pretty serious distress. But Jesus is found, right? His presence becomes made known. And where is he at? But in the temple. And when they find their son, Mary says, I think what any normal human mother would say, which is, how could you have treated your parents in this way? Don't you know we were searching for you in great distress? And here's the part of the story where Jesus begins to teach Mary and Joseph, his parents, something, and us as well. Because his response is sort of strange, right? If a child was lost from their parents for, for multiple days in a row, you would not expect their first response to be what Jesus says to his mom and dad. And he says this. He says, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house. Why were you looking for me? That's the first thing he's going to say to his parents when they find him after he's been missing. A strange response we get from Jesus. 
but it's clear that he's teaching something here. And it even tells us in the text that his parents didn't really understand his response. Well, Jesus' response is almost like he's saying, I'm right here. In other words, why were you looking somewhere else? I'm right here where I said I was going to be. And notice that even though they were distressed, now Mary and Joseph are not distressed because Jesus has been made known to them. His presence is there. I'm right here is almost his response. Why were you searching for me? I'm right where I said I was going to be. And what is Jesus teaching us here? Well, he's sort of teaching us the answer to the question, where is God? Where is God? God, that question is a pretty important question um, for any serious religious practitioner. If you're a worshiper of God, you generally want to know where God's at, right? And even if you can't get there, the goal is to figure out where he is. Well, in our story in the Gospel of Luke, <clears throat> Jesus' parents are asking this question, where's Jesus? And they set off in search to find him. But they've forgotten his words. They've forgotten the words that God revealed to them about their son, which would have told them where to find him, where he said he was going to be. Right? It says, uh, the translation we read was the in my father's house translation, but in the Greek it can also be translated among the things of my father. And where did they find Jesus? They found him in the temple. And the temple in the Old Testament, before Jesus comes along, that was the place where God dwelled among his people. That's where he promised to be found. That was the box that he put himself in for the sake of his people, was the temple. That here is where I can be found. Here is where you can make sacrifices to me for the atonement of your sin, etc., but now that Jesus has come into the picture, a new thing is happening, or rather the fulfillment of the old thing, that no longer is the dwelling of God merely going to be in the temple, but the temple is going to be destroyed and made anew in Jesus. But our God doesn't stop there. You see, our God uh, has a hidden side, a side that we can't know or understand, which is a mystery to us, but he also has a revealed side, and Jesus is part of that revealed side. In Jesus, God reveals himself to us in a way that we can understand for our benefit, right? In Jesus, he's putting himself in another one of those boxes, and this is just the beginning. Throughout Jesus' ministry, he continues to follow this trend of God limiting himself in specific ways for our benefit, right? He puts himself in the box of baptism. He puts himself in the box of the Lord's Supper. He puts himself in the box of God's Word and the church. All places where God has promised to be found. Every time you go there, every time you go to the Word, God is there giving you the gift of the Holy Spirit through hearing God's word. Every time that you go to the waters of baptism, those who are baptized are saved and receive the Holy Spirit. Every time we come to the table of the Lord, we receive the body and blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins and for the sustaining of our faith. But often, we are like Mary and Joseph, aren't we? We are searching in great distress. Maybe you know some of these people in your life. Maybe they don't know Jesus, and they're trying to fill the God-sized hole in their life with many other things. And they remain in that great distress, that, lo that lost place in search of peace. Or maybe it's like you and me, we we know where God is found and we come to find him. But at times when great problems or struggles arise, we're tempted to take over and go our own way and search in our own way and look in places where God has not promised to be. 
And it is in those times that we do suffer distress. But part of the purpose of the word and the ways that God has limited himself is so that we may be drawn back to him and the places where he's promised to be. Because there is where we find relief from our great distress. Just like Mary and Joseph were relieved from their distress when they went to the temple and they found Jesus right where he said he was going to be. See, that's why Jesus' response was, why were you searching for me? I've already told you where you can find me. I'm right here, just where I said I was going to be. So dear brothers and sisters in Christ, maybe you're going through some tough times right now. Maybe you're struggling financially. Maybe you have health problems. Maybe you have a split family. Maybe you are struggling with spiritual issues in your home or among those you care about. Take heart that in spite of those struggles, God's place in your life is constant. You don't need to go on a quest or search for him in far off places. He's right where he's promised to be when he came to you as Jesus. He's present in his word and in his sacraments and in his church. After all, that's why you're here today. You're here today because when God decided to put himself in a box, by grace and faith, you've opened that box and you know where to find him. May that thought bring you peace and joy. And may your desire be to bring that peace and joy for all of those in our lives who are searching in great distress so that we can point them to where God has promised to be. And they too can find Jesus among his father's things, right where he said he would be. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, who is right where he said he would be, until he comes again in glory to make all things new. Amen.